Um, so this morning's speaker is a uh, seasoned member of the C++ committee. Uh, actually, he's been around in the C++ committee for about as long as I've been alive. Um, <laughs> he's a member of the direction group, and he's definitely one of the people that, um, when he starts speaking in a room, everybody just shuts up and listens to him, which is quite something if you know other people in the committee. <laughs> Uh, so he's also a C++ compiler expert. Uh, he works for EDG. Um, uh, it's a compiler that implements all standards of C++, but also provides most of the extensions from MSVC, Client, and GCC. He's also the only person in the world to have figured out how to implement export, export templates before they were removed, because, well, nobody else could figure out how to implement them, right? <laughs> um, and so most of you probably know him as the primary author of the C++ template book. Uh, which has been the reference for almost uh, the reference for templates for almost like two decades now. Um, and finally, um, he's probably the best person to be giving this morning's talk because he's been driving most of the uh, of the work in the committee uh, regarding improving compile time computations. So, without further ado, please uh, welcome David Mandelbaum. Thank you. You make me look good. Uh, we'll talk about the payment after lunch. <laughs> uh, all right. I thought we'd talk about uh, C++ constants. Um, and um, I'm not talking about uh, that constant feeling of happiness you have when you're going to the class, or maybe the constant frustration as you're waiting for your build system to do its thing. No, I'm actually talking about um, those things that you compute at compile time. All right. So, um, what is a C++ constant? Hey. My clicker's there. Yes, actually, it works. OK. So constant expressions are generally f easy to understand. You, you kind of look at your expressions, and if, you're, if you know a little bit of C++, you'll say, well, wow, I know this is constant. But if you, want it, if you care about uh, the nitty gritty, about the minutia, then there's a little bit more. Um, and spoiler alert, we're going to talk about minutia in this, in this talk. If you don't like minutia, this might not be your talk. But so if you start looking at minutia, you'll get to our grammar terms. It's in the standard grammar terms are in italics with little dashes in them. So, so yes, you get a grammar term. Um, you have a superset of constant expressions. You might have, um, I think I, this thing has become flaky. Oh, well. Um, you may have uh, subsets like integral constant expressions or converted constant expressions or non-type template arguments or um, you start caring about the, instant, the, the meaning of um, initializations, and that determines whether things are usable in constant expressions. Then you need some building blocks, you know, of course, literals and things like size of and the line of. Um, and it just keeps on coming, right? There's things like permitted result of a constant expression. Uh, and since uh, in, in um, oh, thank you. In C20, we have this new notion of manifestly constant evaluated. Um, Oh, awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, const expert, we have had for a while, but now we have const eval, we have const in it, and we've got some pretty magical function, is constant evaluated. And I've only just started scratching the surface, and I'm not gonna fit this in an hour and 30 minutes. Okay, so my goal today is just to hit three topics on, within this whole thing. The first thing I want to give you a sense of what uh, the mental model is and sort of the, the formal principles in the standard, what, what the standard thinks of as, um, you know, how constant expressions actually work. Uh, the second thing I want to do is uh, sort of do an overview of how we went from C++11 to C++20 and give you a feel for some of the newer features of C++20. And then my third part will be talking a little bit about implementation. And not so much about how do you implement that, because that's my day job, but sort of what's the state of implementations and, and some perhaps surprises. Okay, well, let's start with C++03. Um, this is sort of the core wording, the, the core paragraph, the core sentences that define a, uh, a constant expression in C++03. There, had, there were several kinds of constant expressions, but the most important one is the integral constant expression. And the way it defines it is to say, well, it can only involve these things, right? Things like literals and size of expressions and stuff like that. And so what he says is, if your structure is built upon these, these building blocks, which are integers for, constant integers for uh, certain purposes, and you don't do a couple of bad things like calling uh, functions and so on, then that's it. It's an integral constant expression. 
Now, I call that an a priori constant model because we decide what is constant before we even evaluate it. Right? And this comes out of uh, 1970s and 80s technology for C compilers and, and C++ compilers, which what they actually do is they parse, and as they parse, they just fold right away. They don't, you know, they, they just decide, okay, if these are two integers and you put an addition there, I, I'm not going to build a representation of that addition. I'm just going to remember the result of it. Okay, so that's the a priori constant model. Now, C++11, um, we think of it as um, mostly having introduced the context per functions, you know, limited versions that just have return statements, and context per variables, and that's, that's what the users see the most, programmers see the most. But actually, the most fundamental change is that we went to an a posteriori model, and the, the core sentence there is, is this one from the standard. And in fact, this was introduced in C++11, but I lifted this from the, from the current draft. Right? So uh, an expression E, and this is any expression, is a core constant expression unless. So we start off with the expression. We've already parsed it. Now we're just going to decide if it actually is a, a, a constant expression. And the way we uh, decide it is that we actually try to evaluate it. Right? So, so it's a posteriori because we, we decide after we do the evaluation. Right? If the evaluation succeeds, fine, then it's constant. Uh, in fact, then it's a core constant. There's a few more rules say, well, and if we like the result that came out of that. Uh, but, but still, it's, it happens. Uh, afterwards. Okay, so there are a couple of things that you can run into that will cause it not to be a constant expression. Um, the first category of stuff that you, you'll run into are things that just don't work. Right? For example, if you have a, a global mutable variable, and um, it would not be very good if you started saying, well, I'll take whatever value it currently has and put that as my constant value. Your programs would break. Right? So that's fundamental to, to the notion of compile time evaluation that we, we will never ever make a mutable global variable a, something you can do, evaluate at compile time. Right? It, it break your programs. Now, the other category of things uh, that you can't do in a, in a constant expression are things that are just considered too hard to do. Right? And the thing about that is that changes over time. For example, throwing an exception. You can't throw an exception in a constant expression um, today. But I suspect that in 2050, uh, C++ 50 will have that feature, and I hope I'll be here to uh, come and tell you about it. Um, so, and we have changed things over time. In C++ 14, you, we added uh, things like loops and if statements. Uh, we're probably going to have uh, context per destructors, non-trivial destructors in C++ 20. So, so this, this does happen. All right, I want to... Um, to uh, make a little piece bold here, it says following the rules of abstract machine. And that actually leads to a, a very fundamental aspect of constant evaluation in um, C++ today. And it's one that um, we're finding in the committee proposes to come and sort of ignore this principle. It's an important principle. If, you, if you're trying to, to um, violate this in the proposal for, the, for, the, um, uh, for an extension to the standard, it's an uphill battle. We are evaluating an expression to test what is constant. During that evaluation, we are in the abstract machine. We're essentially no longer in the compiler. So things that um, you might think you could do because, well, aren't you being evaluated by the compiler? You can't actually do in this model. You can't do any parsing. You can't start um, template instantiations. You can't start creating new types. And um, Andrew Sutton, Actually, I uh, wrote a paper, if uh, you go on WG21 link, P0992, it explains this in, in quite some detail. And he did that because he was frustrated by the number of emails he got from people saying, why can't I do this or that or that? Well, you, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can't do during evaluation. The only thing you can do is basically simulate an idealized machine. An example of, a case of something that has been proposed a few times now in the stand, I mean, to the committee, is context for parameters. People would like to have um, to annotate a parameter as const expert and say, well, if I call that, you know, I promise I'll call it with a constant, but now I should be able to use it as a constant expression in my function. The problem is that now the things inside your function have to be instantiated, and we can't do that while we do constant evaluation. Okay, well, so if we have to evaluate it, uh, we may run into a problem, which is the things we need to evaluate the expression may not actually exist because that, that expression might refer to um, instantiations or special member functions. So there are a number of rules 
that say, and these rules are called needed for constant evaluation, uh, that say when these things have to be created by the compiler before we start evaluation. So instantiation special member functions. Uh, we already have in the language a term for that for the runtime equivalent of that. Uh, it's called ODR used. Uh, can I see a show of hand of how many people feel they understand what ODR used mean in C++11? <laughs> OK, well, you might not know it formally, but you kind of feel that, well, if I call a function, it better be defined. Otherwise, it's not, it's not going to link, right? Um, so so if you, you, you're probably going to see this term needed for constant evaluation show up more after C++20 because it's become a little more important. And the way to think about it is like ODR used, but for compile time. And so a function might be needed for constant evaluation, but not needed for runtime, or vice versa. Okay. Um, now I'm going to show a few examples to kind of give you a feel of how it works. It's, it's mostly intuitive, right? So I've got a test copy uh, template here. And uh, like all good functions, it returns uh, 42. But, um, but it does this thing here where it copies a T. And now I have this naughty class here that deletes my copy um, constructor. So if I ever instantiate this over N, if I instantiate the definition, I'm going to get an error there. Right? So if test copy of n is needed for constant evaluation, my program is not going to compile. OK, well, here is a first use of test copy of n. And I'm applying decal type of it. Well, in order to know the, the type returned by test copy, do I actually need to know its definition? Yes, no? Uh, no, right? You don't need it. So you don't need it, so I don't need to instantiate that, and this is perfectly fine. Right? So that's intuitive. It's not needed for constant evaluation, even though I have a call there. OK, no error. Next, um, I have a, uh, a variable that I initialize with the value of test copy of n. So really, I would like that variable to be initialized with the right answer, which is 42. But we do need the value now. We can't, compute, we can't get to that return until we get through this code. So this is obviously an error, right? So you're with me. At this point, um, test copy of n is needed for constant evaluation. All right. Let's make a, a more interesting example. I've got a size of. Size of is like, um, is like decal type, right? You, you don't actually evaluate the expression that's in there. But this is not an expression. This is a type. It's an array type. And that type is not determined until I know the dimension. So error or not error? Yeah. Error, right? I have to evaluate this. So still pretty intuitive. This is the most difficult example uh, in the whole presentation. Uh, I'll, I'll just want a show of hand. Uh, take a look at it. We have a decal type, uh, calls a function g somewhere. We'll do overload resolution, and we're going to pass in uh, a call to test copy of n, and it's through a, a base initializer. Show of hands. Um, it's an error. <laughs> okay, I, I, I give you a few seconds. Okay. Again, show of hands, come on. Be bold. All right, a few hands. Who, who thinks it's, uh, it's, it's valid? No, it, it doesn't depend. This is, this is uh, the language says exactly what to do here. Okay, so most people think it's okay. It's an error. Um, why? Narrowing. Who said narrowing? Correct. So when you have a brace initializer, uh, narrowing conversion rules come in. And uh, test copy return an in, as you might remember. And maybe this would bind to a char, right? Would initialize to a char. Then you go from in to char. That could be narrowing, except the language says, if it's a constant, and you can tell that the constant would actually fit in a chart, then it's not narrowing. So in order to know whether it's narrowing or not, I don't only need to, not only need to know the type, I need to know the value. And therefore, the, 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 the new language rules for C++20 say, if you get into this situation, it's needed for um, constant evaluation. And even before we, we figure out what G actually is, you have a, a, an expression inside the base initializer needed for constant evaluation. Make sense? A little subtle, not something you'd kind of see right away in your code, uh, but that, that happens. OK, so that's, um, I think, the abstract principles of uh, constant evaluation. 
Uh, let's see what has happened since uh, C++11. Um, thanks to Richard Smith, we went from having mostly just return statements in our context for functions to being able to have mostly general freeform functions. Then a um, friend of mine, Faisal Valley, um, made Lambda's uh, context expert. That's nice. Uh, but we also got this weird, weird little change in C++17, which has that template arguments, uh, or template parameters, however you want to look at it, template arguments, um, were still in the a priori C++03 model. They did not follow the other rules of the standard. And, and to show you this, uh, here's a little uh, template structure that takes a reference. And it's kind of unusual. You know, not too many people write uh, templates that take a, a non-type template parameter of reference type. But you can do that. And um, you can have a global variable, and then you can instantiate S over that global variable. This reference gets uh, bound to that. Fine. Well, until C++17, the way we expressed this was structurally. We said it has to exactly be the name of a variable. It has to be an ID expression. Um, so if you wrote something like this, so I've got a context per function here that returns i by reference, right? So call to ref i provides you the same L value that is a mention of i. It's the same, it's the same thing, really, right? And the compiler knows it's the same thing, but if you did this in C++11 or C++14, it was an error. Because it was a priori. It said, no, 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 you have to have this structure. That's it. Then C++17, we change the rules. You evaluate it. You figure out if it's okay. There's still constraints and say it has to be essentially a global variable, but, but however you get to that global variable doesn't matter. It could be, could be that there's a condition in your function there. All right? Okay, so that was C++17, fairly minor uh, changes. For C++20, we have a whole bunch of good stuff for you. Um, <laughs> first, changing active union members, and uh, Louis, we have you to thank for that. Um, here's an example. Um, the active member of a union is the, is the last one you, you initialized, or in some cases assigned to. So if I have a union here that initializes F, that means that in my function G, when I initialize U, the active member will be F. Okay, well, until C++20, doing this, where you try to change active member through assignment or through construction, was just uh, invalid. As soon as you did that, the evaluation became uh, non-constant. So if you did a static assert here, you'd get an error saying that that expression here is not a constant. Uh, in C++20, this actually becomes valid. And I believe it's really important for some of the library components. Uh, is it variant needs this? Or, or? Yes, small string, string optimization also needs that. So then, thank you, Louis. Um, next, uh, virtual context per functions uh, that we, we owe to um, Peter Dimov and uh, Vasil Vasiliev. And what I find fun about that is that you can actually mix virtual and constant expert and have one override the other or back. So you can go with, with a constant expert uh, function and then override it with a, a virtual function. So how does it work? Well, the dispatch information is, is a compile time thing. It's really, um, if you think of your virtual tables, they're immutable. So the compiler can simulate those. So the dispatch part has always been computable. And so the only thing that matters is that at the end of your dispatch, you end in a constant like per function. As long as you do that, constant evaluation can continue. For example, I've got um, a function g here that expects a b. b doesn't have a constant like per virtual function, but that doesn't matter. It's what actually gets called that matters. So if I call g with a c which does have constant like per, then I land, I land, this p of f lands over here, and we're good, and we just finish, and this, this is perfectly fine. Whereas this H call here, which expects a C, and C is indeed context per, the static type doesn't actually matter. Because I pass it in a D, I'm going to land in this one, which is not context per, and I get an error. Make sense? I'll come back to that because there's a wrinkle. There's a wrinkle on this a little bit later. Um, since we can do you know, that kind of metadata of, of classes for virtual functions, we can also do it for uh, dynamic cast and we can do it for type ID. Strangely, we can still not do it for virtual base classes. Nobody needs that. Um, <laughs> but the type ID is interesting because, yes, you can evaluate at, const at compile time, and you get, you'll get an L value, but there's not much you can do with it because the contents of the type info object, they're not necessarily known by the compiler front end. That some some uh, implementations actually wait until runtime to generate that. So the, the name member or the before member, you can't use it, not, not as a constant. 
All right. Another thing we have Louis to uh, thank for is a uh, context for try. So it used to be until C++ 17, just mentioning a try block in your function, your context for function, was actually an error. Even before you evaluated it, just defining it was an error. Uh, so we removed that, um, that uh, constraint. Um, you still can't throw or catch. As I said, I'll be back in a couple of decades to, uh, to announce that we don't, we've removed that, um, that feature. And this is the big one, I think. Um, we're, oh, I should say, these first four, they're actually in the working draft. Uh, they're all implemented, not a problem. Um, then this one, we've in principle agreed on, the full committee still has to vote on it, and we have to finish the words. Hopefully in July that will happen. But we'll be able to do uh, dynamic allocation and deallocation. Uh, and also you'll be able to do construct add and destroy add, although not placement new. So the things you're going to be able to use for dynamic allocation are plain new expressions, not place new, placement new. And, um, and they have to dispatch or to sort of replaceable operator new. Uh, and also the default allocator in the library. Um, now, there is another constraint, which is whatever you allocate, you have to deallocate before the, before the evaluation is done. And I'll show you an example of that in a sec. Um, now, because you need to do that cleanup, you'll probably want uh, destructors, so we're also adding destructors and we're allowing them to be non-trivial. Right? So people who are into context for all the things, I think you'll be happy. Um, so here's an example. I have a function f um, that returns a vector, and thanks to Louis' work also, we'll be able to uh, have vector in, in context for, which is going to build on all these features. Um, so that allocates some storage, and I returned so far so good. I have a function g here, which calls f. So I get back this, this blob of memory that's been allocated. I call size, and then, then the temporary gets destroyed. So by the time I'm, I'm calling g, all my allocated memory is gone. So that is fine. So under those circumstances, it is a constant expression, and this works fine. Here's a slightly more subtle example. I call f, so I have this temporary still sitting there with my dynamic allocation. I take the element two there and I compare it to two. I still have that temporary sitting there, but this is a full expression. So the destructor will run, and if at the end of the full expression everything's cleaned up, I'm still okay. So that's okay in C++ 20. Now the thing that we will not have, and we, we were hoping to have, but we will not, uh, because we found some problems with it, uh, is that you cannot say, well, I have a vector here. It allocates dynamically, and then you, the compiler somehow manages that at compile time, because since it's not deallocated, you know, what happens with that storage at runtime with storage that was actually uh, allocated at compile time. Now, we actually had a solution for this, uh, which was we were going to promote that dynamically allocated stuff, dynamically allocated compile time. We're going to just promote that to static storage during runtime. And in December, after we had written all the words, everything was ready and we thought we're good, uh, we found a, a semantic problem in there. Then we devised a solution, but the solution is shall we say, subtle. And uh, we, we presented it to uh, Evolution, uh, and they thought it was a little too dangerous to put in C++ 20. So hopefully C++ 23. Okay, so that's why, that's how we've been relaxing gradually uh, what's going on um, with ConstExpr in the language. Um, <laughs> now, these things don't live in a vacuum. Right, the, most of these things, these evolutions you've seen for C++ 20, they're actually being driven by a, a project in the committee, which is to have static compile time reflection. Uh, now, later in the week, uh, David Sankel will present to you a, the TS, which is based on types and template metaprogramming. But uh, a few years ago, we decided that we'd, um, we'd change direction uh, because template metaprogramming doesn't scale very well, and also generating types based on the contents of, contents of your program is a, is a recipe for ODR violations. Um, so we've, we've agreed that um, we'd be better off with a, uh, a context-based model, but we didn't have all the, all the things we needed for it. Right. So we've started developing new context-based capabilities, and I've shown you a bunch of relaxations, things like the destructors, the allocations, the try blocks, and so on. But we also needed a couple of completely new features. Um, and one of them is constant-eval const functions. So what's a constval function? Well, it's like a constexpr function, right? You write it the same way, you just replace constexpr by constval. Uh, and conveniently, it has exactly the same number of letters. So when you, when you replace constexpr by constval, you don't have to realign all your code. It'll be just beautiful. Um, it's, it's really important when you design language to think about those kinds of things. Um, 
We, we had a bug in the proposal before because the previous keyword had one more character, but we fixed it. Um, so the rule for conceval is, you, you remember how constant expert may or may not produce a constant, right? You won't, uh, but conceval has to produce a constant. If it's not a constant, it's an error, right? So if I call it with 42, perfectly fine. The result is 42 is a constant, I get, um, I'm fine. But if I call it with a variable here, then you'll actually get an error. Whereas if you were a constant expert, you would silently switch from uh, static, uh, static initialization to dynamic initialization. Okay. Of course, there's some situations where we don't want to right away do the evaluation. So for composition purposes, suppose you have another constant function that wants to call another constant function. At this point, this is not a constant expression, and yet it's not an error because we're in a constant context. Because we're inside a constant value function, you can. If you were to replace this G here by constant expert, this would become an error. Right. But because we're in constant value, we know that, well, eventually it'll be constant. Um, so G, G of 42 is okay. Um, G of X is an error. And interestingly, let's do this. We call G of F of X, right? Both constant value functions. F of X here is not a constant, yet f of x is not actually an error because I'm inside the call for g. Uh, but then g will give you the error. Okay. But so it's not just within the definition of a function that you, you can have these non-constant cases, you can also have it within the argument of, um, of a constant value function. Slightly subtle and I can tell you really mess to, a mess to implement, at least for us, um, but, but we did. Okay, so I presented constant value functions as functions that have, they lack like constant expert, but they have to be constant. And that's how we started thinking about it uh, at first. Uh, but it turns out we think there's a better model for it. So we have now three different kinds of functions, ordinary functions, constant expert functions, and constant value functions. Ordinary functions exist at runtime. Constant expert functions exist at runtime and compile time. You can take their address and call them indirectly at runtime. That certainly works. And, um, but you can also evaluate them at compile time. So they exist in both. A constant value function is never code generated. It does not exist at runtime. <coughs> because of that, for example, you can take its address, but the address cannot be assigned to a variable or something. The address is a bit like a call. It, it has to stay within the constant value world. Now, since it doesn't exist at uh, runtime, what about virtual functions? Can you have virtual constant, uh, constant uh, eval function? The answer is yes. So you can have a, uh, a constant eval virtual function like this. Uh, that is valid, but unlike the constant expert, which you could mix and match, I mean, in the override rules, you could, you could do it either way. Um, you cannot, um, so you, you, like I said, right, you, you override f, which is constant expert, and it overrides non constant expert, that's perfectly fine. But with constant eval, you cannot do that. Why? because there's a runtime uh, structure, the, the virtual function table, which points to things, and since G doesn't e exist in the runtime world, there's no way to point to it. Right. So that, that's a constraint. It, it makes sense when you sort of work through it, uh, but on the other hand, you could add compile time to the override. These things do not show up in your virtual function table. They do not take any footprint in your, in your, in your program. And, uh, whoa. I pressed the wrong button, sorry. Um, uh, as a result, they are kind of useful to replace certain kinds of macros. All right, so that's the story for uh, constant value functions. And for, for functions, we have now three kinds. What about variables? Same thing, right? Ordinary variables exist at runtime. Constant per variables exist in both. And when you think about it, because, go ahead, is the question? The question was, can I create an instance of B at runtime and use it? The answer is yes. And I cannot call H. And you cannot call H on the runtime uh, thing, that's correct. Okay. All right, so back to our variables. So we have ordinary variables and we have context for variables which live in both. And if you think about it, because they live in both, it has to be immutable. Because if you're, if you're, uh, Say, say, say your context variables were mutable, right? Suppose that uh, up there this V 
we had decided, well, you know, const expert doesn't apply const, right? Then if I call a, a runtime function on it, who knows what the value is? And, and trying to, to compile time evaluate v would make no sense because I'd get a, an, in, an inconsistency between what happens on runtime and compile time. So the only, that, that's the, the fundamental reason why const expert variables are, are, are constant. It's not just because we thought it should be, uh, or it'd be neat. We, we already have a const keyword for that. It's because it has to be um, consistent across both worlds. Well, what about const eval variables? They are not in C++ 20. Uh, they were in the very first proposal of const eval functions, who, which were not cons called const eval at the time. Uh, but we had the semantics all wrong because we weren't following this mental model. But now we're thinking, uh, since they only live at compile time, they could be mutable. We could create this notion of a variable that can change as you translate the translation unit. Like say, often you want like identifiers that you just generate, right? And then you need a counter that increases all the time. We could do that with const eval uh, functions. You just increase them in a const eval function and then with a bit of metaprogramming, you create a new variable name, right? Or maybe you want a registry in which you register stuff as you parse things. We could do that, right? So we're at early design stages uh, for that, but it's looking pretty good. We think we can make that work. Uh, there is some real subtlety with Fine, but we'll hopefully find our way through that. Uh, there is a question there. Can you create an object that has all of the functions, including the constructor, as const eval? Yes, you can. So the question was, can you uh, create an object with everything const eval, but you're still bound to the rules of, uh, of uh, const eval evaluation, so you could not create an, an object at runtime of that object? Yes, you can. So the question is, can you, from a const eval function, call a const expert function? And the answer is yes. But it has to produce a constant in the end, so you cannot fail that evaluation. All right, so that's for const eval functions. Um, another, so, so we needed that for uh, reflection, and the reason why we need it is that reflection hands you a handle into compiling internals. It would be very bad if we couldn't guarantee if, we, if that would start leaking into the runtime, because there are no compiling internals at runtime. So that's, that's where that came from. Um, we also wanted an API uh, to transfer collections of things and names of things, right? Because if you, you ask for this, the non-static data members of a class, for example, you need a, a collection of reflections. Right? I call a reflection uh, one of those handles into the compiler. And so, um, thanks to Louis, he did all the, the, the work of driving this. We're making vector and string usable in constant expressions. Uh, if everything goes well, we'll have that in C++20. Right? And so that depends on constant expert dynamic allocation, it depends on the structures um, and on placement and, uh, cons uh, construction. But it also, and the try box, but it also needs, uh, what we noticed is that libraries often do tricks for maximum performance that are absolutely unfriendly to, um, to constant evaluation, things that we just cannot uh, evaluate at compile time. For example, one of the big enemies of constant evaluation is reinterpret cast. Because reinterpret cast is very tightly bound to the target machine. There's no way we can uh, emulate that uh, in some efficient way in the compiler. So we'll never have re uh, reinterpret cast at uh, constant evaluation. So um, let me show you is constant evaluated to an example. Suppose you have a clear bytes function, and um, basically you, you clear uh, n bytes starting from uh, a pointer p. Right? You could do that just with the dem set. Right? It's optimized to death for, for your particular architecture, it'll be very, very efficient at runtime. The problem is, memset is not a const expert function. So if you were to only have that as your clear bytes, this const expert is actually an error, because there's no way to use it. So what is constant evaluated says is, well, if we're being evaluated in a context where this, it matters that this is constant, then this is going to be true. Right? Is constant evaluated is going to be true and we'll evaluate this very generic loop. But if it's not, so if, for example, we evaluate it at runtime, then this is gonna be false, and we'll evaluate the, the memset call. Um, Peter? Uh, could, could compilers actually implement the first loop as memset at runtime? If they're very good, yes. So the question was, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't this be uh, optimized really well? I suspect yes, but this is a simple example to fit on a slide. Uh, it's not just about memsets, it's about any code that you, you've tuned using as inline assembly or, or you know, whatever trick that is not friendly to constexpert. Is this a discarding statement? 
But yes. Sorry, what was the correct? So if, if, uh, if constant evaluation becomes true, then the, the, the fourth branch becomes a discarded statement? Uh, no, this is not an if constant expert. Um, but I, I'll, I'll talk about that in a sec. In fact, I'm going to have to ask to hold the questions to the end because my timing is a little off. <laughs> Uh, but I think I'm, gonna, I'm about to answer your question. So, so you might wonder, well, wait a minute, now we have a if, isn't that going to slow down things? But of course, for the compile time case, it matters less. It, it's evaluated at compile time. And for the runtime case, what actually happens is that when I generate code for this, I generate a zero, a constant zero for that. I, I know if I, if I send this to the back end, the back end is never going to see the true case, so I give a zero there, right? and a zero, a false constant. And so the back end just immediately discards this, and there's actually no cost at runtime, right? even, even with very low levels of optimization. All right, so now let's use, I uh, call my clear bias from this very, very, very silly function, right? But uh, I just want to create a function that does various things that are now valid in, in C++ 20. And um, so I call clear bytes in there, and then in the end I return a, a value, okay? And let me call it with a G of 85, and you all know the, the result for G of 85 will of course be 42. Uh, but how does this work? Uh, I, call, I call G of 85, and I'm initializing a global variable S. Does it matter whether it's constant or not? The answer is yes, because if it's constant, it's static initialization. If it's not constant, it's dynamic initialization. So what the language says is you have to do a tentative evaluation with is, to, is a constant evaluated equal to true. So I'm going to try to evaluate that, and this now works. Clear bytes is going to go to the loop case because it's constant evaluated, it's true, and this is tentative. Then I evaluate everything, 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 and I come back with a constant. We're good. So this is get static evaluation. If I do the, uh, a call G of S, again, I try this tentative evaluation with is constant evaluation equal to true, but I immediately fail because binding S to N is not a constant expression. So that fails, so we do another evaluation, but at runtime with that condition equal to false. And now I will call memset, and it will be dynamic initialization. Now here's a more interesting case. I'm calling return g of 85. This is the exact same expression as this one. But does this matter whether it's constant or not from a language perspective? And the answer is no, except for that is constant evaluation case, which we ignore. So therefore, this is, the compiler is still allowed to, compile, to uh, evaluate as a constant if it wants to, but it has to do so with that function is constant evaluated equal to false. That sort of makes sense? Just to make sure it makes sense, uh, let's look at a few more cases. These are cases from the, the first cases were not from the standard, these are from the standard. Okay, I have a uh, struct S, which takes a non, uh, a non type template parameter, and I pass, oops, sorry, I pass, um, it's constant evaluated in it. True or false? True, okay, it's, it has to be a constant, so we have to evaluate with, with that equal to, um, to Another case, I'm initializing, again, a global variable with uh, some expression. Because the global variable, it matters whether it's constant or not. So we're going to try to see if it's constant with the, is constant evaluated equal to true. Okay, I evaluate with equal to true. I find y, which is a mutable variable, so this is not a constant. So I fail this. This is no longer constant evaluation. So now this becomes, um, so, so I'm going to have to evaluate this with is constant evaluated is constant evaluated equal to false. Ironically, when I do that, I get a constant. <laughs> but it's too late. Okay, this is dynamic initialization, and this, this thing is an error. You cannot um, dimension an array with a, with a non-constant. All right? So that's a little, little interesting, I thought. Um, and by the way, when we, I mean, I'm presenting to you, I'm hoping this is going to feel natural and, uh, and, and straightforward, but I can, you know, the core working group, their heads literally exploded when we tried to work out the exact rules for this. Uh, it, was, it was really, we, we really had some hairy cases with slightly different uh, semantics. Uh, okay, so B is very similar, but now uh, if you evaluate it true, you get a constant two. So this is now static initialization. Now I take the same expression again, I put it in parentheses, and I add something to it. Try to evaluate it with, with equals to true, but immediately you get an error. Well, not an error, you, you fail constant evaluation. So therefore, even though this is the same expression, 
This time is constantly evaluated as false. Okay? Final example. This is my favorite one. Um, I start parsing f, and I encounter this n here, which is a type int const. Does it matter whether it's const initialized or not? Yes, no, maybe? Yes, because, because it's an integral constant variable. If it's not constant or not integral, it doesn't matter. But for that case, there are rules that say, yes, if it were constant evaluated, then you can use it as an, as an array dimension. So we try with if constant evaluated is true, we find a constant, so all is good. This n is now and forevermore equal to 13, right? If we later evaluate f in a context where it's constant evaluated, it doesn't have to be true, that's too late. We've, we've frozen this. Once it's true, it's true. Now, m is not constant, so it doesn't actually matter from a language perspective whether it's, this thing is constant or not. So we do not decide this is constant evaluated because we're still parsing the function. So we, we don't really know. So this, this stays that expression. Char of this works because this was a constant, so it's 13. So I'm returning m plus size of r, which is 13. So I'm returning m plus 13. Let's call f. Ah, I'm initializing a global variable. Does it matter that it's constant or not? Yes. So I evaluate this. I decide this was 13. I cannot change my mind. But now this one I hadn't decided yet. But it matters, so I'm, I'm assimilating it with is constant evaluated equal to true. I find 13. Good. Uh, so I'm returning 26. That's a constant. This is static evaluation, uh, static initialization with uh, 26. Let's do it again, but this time I add p in the mix. But p is not a constant. So when I do my trial evaluation, it fails right away on this p, and I have to re retry at runtime or notionally at runtime. You're still allowed to optimize it. Uh, with is constant value, it's false. So this time, I still have my 13, I've committed to that, but this time here, I'm gonna get a 17. Right? And so I'm returning 30 instead of 26, and this becomes 56. Are you all with me? Are you excited about using this feature? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, as you, as you notice, it can become subtle whether something is statically initialized or not, right? And that's what was already, it's already, already been the case in C++. And so um, wouldn't it be nice if you could make sure that you really get what you meant to get, right? Wouldn't it be nice if you could say um, it has to be constant initialized, and if not, give me an error. And so we will have that using this constant keyword in C++20, I think. It's working through the process. I think it will make it. I saw a hand up. Oh, uh, so the question is, wouldn't constexpr do the trick? Um, constexpr means const. And sometimes all you want is just that it's dynamically initialized. Uh, sorry, that it's statically initialized, but you still want it to be mutable. Mostly you want to avoid order of initialization issues. So this int of p here is not const. It's still mutable, but you're sure that it'll be initialized at program load time and not after you execute main, for example. You won't have weird ordering problems with your initialization. Uh, go ahead. That's a good question. Um, let's do the exercise. We have it here on the screen. Right, suppose I first have P and then F. Right? Well, I start, if I, the answer is it won't matter. Right? But I evaluate this with is constant evaluated equals to true. So I'm going to go through this whole thing, and I'm going to conclude I've got, I've got 26 return here. And then I try P, and I'm like, oh, not a constant expression. So I discard all of that, and we restart at runtime, or notionally at runtime, with is constant evaluated equals false, and you get back the same result. So it, it's not that subtle. And in fact, that kind of questions is what made the core working group head spin, and we had to figure these things out to make sure at least it doesn't, it shouldn't start depending on that. I mean, as it is, it's complicated enough. I saw one other hand here. Oh, oh, oh over there. Um, should it be considered undefined behavior when the, the const evaluated branches in two different states? So the question is, uh, should it be considered un undefined behavior? The answer is not, it's not um, considered undefined behavior, but you're going ahead of me. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, if you're interested in the paper for constant, it's P1143. 
but I, I'm going to uh, talk about this exact thing. All right, so um, first, The recommended uh, idiom here, the one I, I really I, I recommend, the only idiom you should use for is constantly evaluated is exactly this pattern. If you call it, you do something context per friendly, else you do something context per maybe not friendly, but you make it mean exactly the same thing. Right? You could do completely different things there, the language doesn't say you can't do that. Right? And if you find some amazing technique using that, more power to you, bring it up to this conference, it'll be for cool. But uh, your, you know, your maintenance people won't love it. Um, so, but I really recommend only sticking to this pattern. These other cases we have seen with is constant evaluated in the middle of expressions. It's neat to think about. It's important for the language to define so we know that the model is consistent. But I wouldn't program that way. But something I've had like at least half a dozen emails about it is like, well, how about you know they show me examples and say I put const expert there. That way I'm sure that this if it's not going to call me, it could cost me at compile time. Do you see what that does? Right? This now has to be constant, so it's always true. And so at runtime, you'll never get the optimization. I mean, in, the, in this case, like Peter said, the compiler will do a good job most likely. But, but if const expert defeats the purpose of this thing, so never use const expert there. The question is, should, could compilers um, diagnose this anti-pattern? I assume so. We're not doing that, but that's a good idea. I should probably look into that. Uh, David? So is a reasonable rule of thumb that uh, is constant evaluated always applies to the nearest nested context that could potentially be constant uh, evaluated? Correct. Exactly. That's exactly right. So the question was, is a good, is a rule, good rule of time that is the nearest context that for which constant evaluation matters? And the answer is yes. Anyway, don't do this. And before you, nobody has proposed this yet, but don't do that either, right? If you make it constant eval, this is going to be um, true, no matter what. And also, don't do it in something that's not context per, because then it's going to be false, no matter what. I have a hand here. The question is, could we overload on const expert? Um, I hinted at it earlier. Um, um, so, that's, so the question is, could we instead avoid this feature and work with overload resolution? We actually looked at that, and we thought it was a much less friendly model. All right. This was my second half. We talked about the new features for C20. I hope it's exciting. Uh, and most of that is implemented. Um, uh, Jeff? On your previous slide, um, if you don't have it, is it only true branch cycle comes function? Yeah, here? Yeah. You can call it calls to comes to function, yes. Yeah. Uh, but it's just if, it's, if, you're, if you're inside a constant context, there is, there's no way to evaluate it where it would not be a constant, a con an expected constant. If it did not have constant value on the function, if I only know it's constant value, it's when predicated on the constant value on the function. So, so there's not, no constant expert here either? <coughs> if there's no constant expert, then, then this is always false. If it's constant expert, it then inside of that, you can do all kinds of stuff that could be constant value. Yeah. Okay, so now I want to talk about implementations and about uh, the speed of constant evaluation because we're going to have this fun, um, this, the fun um, static reflection features and hopefully metaprogramming features and we'll be able to do all kinds of uh, great stuff, maybe not in C++ 20, but in some, let's say in the coming decade. I, I expect we'll have some exciting stuff in the coming decade. And it's a lot lighter weight than template instantiation. So computing with expressions and with values, um, the compiler can do it much more efficiently <laughs> Than with instantiation. The problem with instantiations is that, um, for various practical reasons, once we instantiate something, none of the compiles can deallocate the, those instantiations. They, they, stick, they stick around. And also, an instantiation of, say, a simple class type is it's not just 10 bytes or so, it's easily kilobytes. Um, so, anyway, so we have these uh, interpreters now in our, in our compilers. Uh, but C++ is not actually uh, interpreter friendly, right? 
the address model, for example, you can have dangling pointers, you can have pointer arithmetic, arithmetic that goes beyond bounds, and in a normal interpreted language, the way you avoid problems is you have a garbage collector and you don't have pointer arithmetic. In fact, you don't have pointers at all exposed to users. But we do, and we have to cache the undefined behavior. And then we, when things go wrong, you probably also want a nice diagnostic that percolates all the way back to the context where you had it. Um, so it, all of that puts constraints on the, on the implementation that make it not so easy to do. What's more, that evaluation happens very early in the compilation process. So the interpreter doesn't have all the kind of information that the backend has. Right? Maybe we could restructure the compiler to, to do it differently, but it would be extremely expensive. Right? So in fact, some tools that have a C++ front end don't have a backend at all. So we, you know, you, it's, it's just very early on. The structures like uh, destructor calls, they're not generated yet by the time we have to evaluate that stuff. So it has to be determined on the fly. Um, and of course, it all depends very much on how you, how you develop your compiler. In fact, talking about compilers, implementations change. You know, you, we, we propose things in the, in, the, in the standard, and then the compiler says, oh, OK, now I've got to implement that. Let's see what I have here. Uh, but I already have a whole history and a whole bunch of baggage. Right? Uh, so how long have we had this baggage for? Well, Microsoft's compiler started in the, in the early 1980s. Right? They had to compile in hundreds of kilobytes, a few hundred kilobytes, 256 maybe, right? So they didn't generate uh, parse trees. That's way too expensive, right? Never, never could we have uh, implemented uh, complex per back then. Um, instead, they, they, they parse straight to intermediate code. And that's been true in the MySafe compiler until very recently. It's only a few years ago that they started generating internal structures representing your program. Uh, GC was a little later in 1987, and the compiler I work on uh, around the same time. And so we do have internal representations, but they're, they were designed with an a priori model in mind. The only compiler that's recent enough to have known that ConstructPro was on the, on the drawing board is Clang. All right, so they saw, they saw C11 uh, coming, and they have, um, if you look at the way Clang uh, evaluates constant, you can tell it's, it's, it's designed for an a, a posteriori model. Um, if you were to look into the Microsoft compilers model, um, I've never seen it, but I've discussed it with the engineers. And yes, they had to build it on top of really old constant evaluation machinery. So did we. Um, so most of the stuff predates uh, the transition. And as a result, we might think that maybe our evaluation is not that speedy. You will see uh, how bad it is. Uh, now, in, when C14 came around, in our case, right, for the EDG compiler, it turned out to be so difficult to retrofit to what we had that we re-engineered the whole thing to some degree. Uh, and that will be reflected in what you'll see also. Okay, uh, who is familiar with Alexander Stepanov's uh, abstraction penalty? A few people. Let me give you the history. Um, in 1997, I was working for Hewlett Packard at the time, and, um, and we had the SEL for a few years, you know, SEL designed by Stepanov. And Stepanov had said, you know, I carefully designed this so that compilers could look straight through my abstractions, and with a bit of optimization, the code you get from using my library is equivalent to handwritten C code. Right. And so then he, he started looking at actual compilers, and he found out that was only true for the very, very simplest cases. So he created a, a benchmark where he put a, a, a C style loop and then like 12 different ways of expressing that loop with different levels of abstraction. So the loop went over an array of doubles, and then he would put the doubles inside a struct containing just a double, or he would change the pointers that he used to iterate into an iterator, or he would put the uh, iterator adapter on top, of the, on top of the pointer, or on top of the iterator, and he had all kinds of combinations. And he said, well, I'm defining the abstraction penalty as a ratio of time for the more, more abstract case divided by the, the time for the not so abstract case. And ideally, it should all be one. Uh, but when I got that, I was working at HP, and he sent me the email, and I applied it, and I think we got one of the abstract cases, one, and everything else became gradually worse and worse and worse. We had, I think, in, in the, the higher cases, it was more than 10. So more than 10 times penalty just for using things, simple things like a, a reverse iterator or something like that. It took some years to come down to one, but modern compilers actually do a really good job of that uh, for runtime code. Well, 
why don't we try to, to uh, apply the same idea to context per evaluation? Right? Now the, it will never come down to one, I don't think, because the optimization and the runtime are actually in the same bucket here. So if you spend some time to try to optimize it, your abstraction penalty just went over one. Okay, well, so here's my framework. I'm going to have a function f, and this is the case where I don't do any work. It's just to see what my baseline is of, of doing other work for the compiler. Uh, it returns n, and I'm gonna, re I'm gonna call it 200 times. i just do that using a recursive instantiation here, and I will call it with different n's, one through 200, okay? By doing that, I disable some compiles that do uh, memorization of calls, because that's not really what I'm trying to measure. I'm trying to measure how fast we can uh, evaluate cons context per calls. And uh, I did this on this laptop, and I had these three compilers installed on there. Uh, so GCA21 is pretty recent. Clang, not quite as recent for me, but uh, it turns out it doesn't make a big difference. My, a colleague of mine did it with uh, a more recent Clang. It's the same numbers, and that's, that's ours. Uh, ours actually goes through a, an intermediate. It's more like Cfront, if you're familiar with Cfront. It, it compiles to C, and then we call GCC to compile that. It doesn't matter much here, because there's not much C to compile. It's all happening at compile time. Okay, so that's a zero work case. How long will it take? GCC, 0.04 seconds on this particular machine, very quick. Clang, comparable, and we're, we're a little slower, but it's, it's not bad, right? So well under a second. Let's put some, um, some real work in that F function. My real work is, well, not really real work, but something, right? Uh, I'm gonna do 10,000 iterations of this uh, and just do a, a token addition in there. Now, if you were to compile this for runtime, compile will right away see that this is, well, not right away, but it was a bit of work. It will see that this whole loop is useless, would optimize it away and do nothing. But of course, we're not doing that at compile time, at least not yet. So uh, this actually, we're actually going to measure something meaningful here. How long does it take? Oh, we went from 0.04 seconds to two seconds. That's actually not bad. We're doing uh, 10,000 iterations 200 times, so over 200 million iterations here. Clang, that's pretty good. And like I said, we, we re-engineer things, so we're a little bit faster. So the point of here is, though, is that the zero work case, we can really ignore the cost of the rest of the compilation. It's really dominated by this evaluating this loop. You with me? All right. Now, before I start putting abstraction on this, uh, I do want to mention, yes, so two million uh, compile time iterations. If you were to do this with, you try to iterate two million instantiations, uh, on this computer it will not work. Uh, I tried it, after two to three minutes, uh, you run out of memory. Um, Clang, I, I tried Clang, which has a, a good implementation, and I made this program. It doesn't do the exact same work, but it creates small instantiations, like structures that just have one field, right? And it creates, it, it creates 50 times 100 times 100, so half a million and it takes two minutes. That's not as good as two seconds. Uh, and, we are, and we're doing much less, much fewer sort of steps. Of course, it's not the purpose of templates, which is fine. If you turn that number 15 to 60, you, get, you, you run out of memory again on my machine. Okay, now let's look at um, adding a very, very tiny little level of uh, abstraction on my, on my int, right? I, I was iterate, iterating uh, with ints, now I'm gonna iterate with a struct of int containing a, an int, and I'm just gonna access it. It's not really encapsulated, it's not real abstraction, but, but let's see how much it costs. Oh, I went from 2.09 to 2.48, it's almost a half second penalty, and I haven't really changed anything, right? That, that's, that's like over 20%. Same for Clang, and in absolute terms, also same for us, but if you look at the graph, we have gotten two times slower, right? That's, that's not very exciting. Okay. Well, certainly derivation costs nothing, right? I, I mean, if I add a little step, derivation step, if you compile this at runtime, even without optimization, it's gonna generate exactly the same code as the other case, right? Sure, surely this is not gonna, ooh. Yeah, no. So we're, if you look, we're, we're more like 50% over for Clang, and everyone has taken a hit. Well, okay, so now we've, hit, we've taken a hit for, for derivation. Um, if I add another level of a derivation, that can't possibly make a difference. You, you're just, at most, adjusting a pointer somewhere, aren't you? And it's, it's, it doesn't matter whether you add four or eight to the pointer. Ooh. All right. So, 
So this is how things are working. But that's not real abstraction. Real abstraction is functions, right? The, the main tool of abstraction in C++ is functions. So I'm going to do a very simple thing. I'm going to add a constructor, and I'm going to access the, my embedded uh, end here through a, an operator. About 10 times slower than using an abstracted uh, end. Right. Now, I contacted the GCC guys to figure out what's going on. What makes this 10 times slower for just doing that? They haven't gotten back to me. So if anyone here is an expert in the GCC internals or how this works, I'd love to hear from you. Um, I've, I know, uh, I've talked to other compilers and I, I know the, the penalties there. You see, Clang does much better. Uh, but still, we're talking about 3x slowdown just for adding, you know, for trying to make things slightly abstract. And we are about 5x slower. Right? But you know, that's not how you make a value class. This is sort of a minimum value class for this particular loop. Oh, the good news is GCC is not much slower. <laughs> uh, but Clang is. Right? We're now f a full five times slower, and we're a little bit slower also. OK? So what's my message here? Well, it's not don't do any abstractions. But do keep in mind that concept evaluation does not benefit from sort of the, the optimizations you might hope for in, you know, at runtime. Are we going to get better behavior? I'm sure. I actually think we're first going to get worse a little bit as we implement additional features and then we'll gradually get things better. Um, but it's never going to be a, a, a zero abstraction penalty. Did you notice something missing in, in these graphs? Yeah. Yeah. What? There isn't, huh? All right, so uh, yeah, now, you know, this, this, it was an accident. I didn't have Microsoft because I don't have Microsoft compiler on my compiler, on my, on my laptop. So I asked, I mentioned this benchmark to a colleague of mine who happened to have a Sigwin environment that has these four compilers on there. And he says, oh, I can give you the numbers. And so he, he gave me numbers. And if, if you compare these graphs, they're relatively the same as what the other were. No, not exactly, but mostly the same thing. But we were shocked by this. But I remember what I said. The Microsoft compiler days from the early 80s uh, has a lot more uh, work to do to, to kind of move forward. So as we think about standard features, and we, we're hoping that all these things are going to do marvelous things for us, the truth is it will take time. I talked to the Microsoft uh, engineers. They understand exactly what's going on here. It is just an artifact of, of evolution, right? of evolving a compiler gradually. You can't just take out hundreds of thousands of lines of code and replace them from one release to another. It, it, it happens gradually. I don't know how many releases it will take to, uh, to fix this, but it does, it's, and it's still better than temporal instantiation in terms of performance. But this is going to take a while. Uh, and even though these numbers now suddenly look really good, uh, <laughs> if you're doing things like uh, ref reflective metaprogramming, right, where you really start generating code and do fun stuff, two million steps is not that much. Not that much work you can do. If you start sorting large collections and so on, you, you're going to get to your, to your two million steps uh, fairly quickly. OK, so that's what I want to talk about. So three things, the, the, the overall fundamentals of how constants are evaluated in C++, where we're going in C20, and what are the practical realities of today. Uh, where are we going to go in the future? Uh, we're working on uh, static reflection and, and also metaprogramming. And I think it's pretty exciting what we're doing there. Um, there are a couple of competing proposals. I'm going to um, push for mine here. So go check out that paper, P1240. Uh, I'm working on that with Andrew uh, Sutton and Faisal Valley. Andrew, you know, he's the guy who brought us concepts. Uh, Faisal has brought you generic lambdas and context for lambdas. Um, there is a partial implementation. It's rough on the edges. But if you go to this particular URL, it demonstrates uh, generating SQL code from reflection, reflection information. It's pretty neat. Uh, and uh, they, 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 they keep on working on that. My interest in what's going in the future is how, what would happen if we were to allow side effects in constant evaluations? Right, right now, we can memoize calls because constant expression evaluation has no side effects. Right? It's completely run on this abstract machine. Uh, it doesn't do anything to your compiler. 
But wouldn't it be neat if you could start reading from a file, right? And generate your code. So instead of having an external script to generate your C++ code, you just have your, your own C++ code generating uh, code from, from some stuff you have in a file on the side. That's, uh, I think that's something we could have within, uh, within the decade. Um, generating instantiations is a much smaller side effect. Uh, and in fact, P1240 talks about it and, 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 and considers that a possibility. Uh, we talked about constant valve variables, which are, in fact, a side effect. Right? Because now calling a constant valve function might suddenly go change permanent state in your, in your translation. Uh, the tricky bit is fine. If you, if you call a function that triggers a constant evaluation, right, and we'd, uh, as part of the overload resolution process, it's kind of annoying that this thing that you might, there might be an unrelated function to your actual call, we, we, we throw it away after we're done. The constant, the constant uh, sorry, the side effect will not be uh, discarded. So we're working on that. We have two, two sort of two-pronged approach. One is a, a queuing model where certain side effects, instead of saying do the side effect, we say queue up the side effect. And if, if this is what we really wanted, you know, if we, we successfully get through this whole process, then commit to it, otherwise don't. The other is something like, uh, like we have is constant evaluated, maybe something like tentative constant, like say, well, you know, uh, just be aware you're being, uh, you're being evaluated here for an evaluation that might be discarded completely, might not, you know, might be sfine or something, or maybe we'll call it is sfine or something. Um, so, so that's what I want to show you. This is obviously pie in the sky thinking, but uh, a bunch of people are working on this. Um, go to the, the talk by David Sankel, uh, obviously, as um, it's gonna show you what, what uh, static reflection can do. Um, very exciting. Oh yeah, one more idea. If you can do this, if you can do side effects, maybe we could have our build system be part of our context per evaluation. Um, <laughs> so so that's, that's my goal. Um, some people I wanna thank, you know, context per came along because Gabby drove the, the feature, but Jens did a lot of the hard work getting the, the wording right and all this stuff about uh, core constant expressions and the exact model, a lot of that work is from Jens. Uh, Richard has done a more enormous work both for C++14, the, all the, the new things there, as well as getting the, the, the words right for a lot of the features we've talked about. Faisal, I mentioned his, his lambdas. Louis has done a lot of work. Nina uh, participated in the, the evaluation, uh, sorry, the dynamic allocation. Peter Dimov and Basile did the um, uh, virtual dispatch and dynamic cast. Andrew Sutton, Wyatt, and Sam are working on uh, all kinds of good stuff, including some things I haven't talked about here, uh, like uh, there is an, a new kind of expansion statement that works really well with const expert. Uh, and Anthony, I need special thanks to because the original idea for dynamic allocation was going to use a special purpose const expert container. So you, you wouldn't program the same kind of containers in const expert as you did else, anywhere else. And he said, no, 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 I'm sure we can make the, the regular allocators work. And at first we thought it was not possible, but he insisted and he was right. And of course, the, the various working groups in the committee um, that make all this possible. Uh, I think we need to deserve a round of applause. And thank you very much. I'm on the committee, but not paying attention to EWG and CORE usually. So one question, I know the um, the committee is usually reluctant to invent new keywords, and now we have a new inflation. I, I wonder if there was ever considered to use const exp mutable instead of const, uh, is it const in it? Yeah. So the question is, um, instead of const in it with a new keyword, did they consider const exp mutable? I don't remember that being proposed. Um, so no, probably not. Uh, there was not much resistance to const in it, as I recall. There, there was probably some, we call it bike shedding, where everyone sort of throws in ideas, uh, but I don't remember context permutable. So this might be in a minority opinion, but I think the stuff that you presented in the first part of the talk is, is something that I feel like I could very easily teach. This, this rule of thumb that you look at the, yeah, sure, you get these surprising things where you put a const in the front and your entire program's behavior you know, changes, but you can reason about that um, by, you know, using this rule of thumb and say, oh, this is a place where I could have, could have had const expert. The part that scares me, and maybe I'm reading too much into this, is these const, mutable const eval, 
variables, which obviously are not in there yet, but they seem like a massive, massive ODR foot gun. And ODR foot guns are like one of the hardest things I've found to explain to people in large code bases. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, How we're we gonna get away from that? I have, I have some thoughts. I cannot get away from it. I think you're correct. It is a, an ODR foot gun. I think it's not as bad as foot guns that come from, from types. Um, but because you, there is more of an expectation that when you access a variable, it can change. Right? It's a variable, it's, it's the, name, the name in there. But you're right, we're, it's, uh, it's not in there, it's not a done deal at all. I'm interested in it because I think it's, it's very powerful for metaprogramming, but I, I think you're absolutely right that uh, the program model might become very dangerous. Great talk. Um, Thank you. You showed that as a D vector, if you have like an L value in many concepts, it doesn't work, and then you showed an example where you had dynamic allocation with new and delete as part of a constructed function for an array. So what's the difference there? Like, are we allowed to have a vector as part of a constructed per function body yes. with a name and then it gets destroyed at the end? What's the case in which it doesn't work? Um, let me uh, try to see if I can get back to that slide. Apologies, oh, I just don't remember exactly where I had that. Yeah, no. uh, okay, yeah, here, right? Yep. Um, so as long as during the whole, so uh, you think of an evaluation as, you know, it's a process, right? It's like a little program that runs inside a compiler. As long as by the end the program is done, every dynamic allocation is gone, it has been deallocated, you're good. Now that's not the case here. Once I've done the, all the allocation here, I have this V which now points to an allocation. My, my evaluation is done, but the allocation is still there. It's not gonna be deallocated until V gets destroyed, which is somewhere else. And that is currently not allowed. So in the body, you could have a non context per vector as part of a context per function, and it would work. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, abs absolutely right. Thank you for the talk. Um, so maybe this is a corner case or a very specific case, but if you need tuples where some of the elements are context pairs and some are not, how does all this interact with that? Have you thought about that? Uh, I have not thought about that. I'm gonna be, be very honest. I'm a compiler writer, I like to write C++, but I'm not a, you know, a world expert on some of these more advanced ideas. So if you show me code, right, I'm gonna be here two more days, if you show me code, I love to reason about code, you show me code and we can talk together about, well, would this be possible? Could you imagine a mechanism that makes this or this work? I love to talk about that stuff. But coming, coming up from, the, from scratch with that, um, I, I probably could not. Okay, just in case you already yeah, thought. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the talk. Um, I had wanted to follow on, on the earlier comment about ODR foot guns. I too have a great fear of ODR, but mostly because it's IFNDR. It'll yes. form no, def no diagnostic required, and I really hate those, because you, know, you have this program, it compiles, and it's never gonna give the right answer, probably. Right. And you don't know how to diagnose this. There's, there's no feedback from the compiler or the runtime is what's going on. I mean, it's great for my uh, reputation score on Stack Overflow, but <laughs> I'd prefer not to, not to have to help people diagnose that. We, our, our compiler actually diagnoses that kind of ODRs. If you want to, it's slow. But we have a mode where you can take a bunch of translation units and say, please find ODR problems in here, and it will. It's not very helpful with the diagnostics. It's, it's going to mostly say there's, a there's an ODR problem in this, <laughs> in this class instantiation. But we can probably improve that. Okay, I just, I just wanted to encourage you as you were thinking about this to, to, to think about well, not just ODRs, but in general, IFNDR. Right. Because that, it would make my life much, much easier if that were, as a concept, were just to die yeah. in a fire. I, I, yes. And now, the good news is, of course, we are getting modules. It doesn't die, but there's a lot of cases that go away. Which is really good. Yes. Yeah. I, thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, I'm actually very far away from having just in time compilers for C++ optimizers inside the front end and just having a separate copy of optimizing backend uh -huh. inside the front end completely like separate from everything else. Is this a way to go with 
completion speed uh, of the conceptual relation. So that's, that's a good question, right? So the question is, uh, are, are we go is it the way to go to start developing advanced optimizers for compile time? And um, I've thought about it a little bit. Uh, it's very hard for the compiler to, to be able to know where it's worth spending that compile time budget on that. What I suspect might happen, say, but I don't think it's going to happen in the next five years, maybe in the next 10 years, is that compilers are going to provide two evaluators, one which is slow but has no startup cost, and one which is fast but, you know, spends some time creating a representation that's more efficient. And it's always going to use a slow one, but you'll, if you happen to have a translation unit that you know, you know this, this is all reflection-based, really expensive loops in there, please optimize. You'll put a, an option on it, and now we'll, for, we'll say, okay, well, we'll assume that all the calls require some optimization. It's possible that it'll also get adaptive, right? Uh, it, it, it's certainly, it's a tech, these are techniques that are used in, uh, in browsers, but they have a, a, a nicer language to work with. Um, and also the, the usage pattern is a little different. Um, the interpreter is called a lot for very tiny things in, the, um, in a compiler. And uh, for them, it's really not worth spending too much time on it, uh, on preparing the, the representation. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I want to follow the performance benchmarks that you showed about the um, compile time evaluation. Uh -huh. And you mentioned a few times that a lot of um, times the, the decision whether something is compile time or not is made quite late because it will first try to do it at compile time and then it's somehow to see, okay, it yes. doesn't work. Yes. So this could mean that a lot of work is done twice. Oh, yes. You know, I, I once, uh, I, I've noticed that my, my compiler very often is reevaluating the same expression over and over because we don't actually remember that it didn't work last time. <laughs> and so it fails, and then a little bit later, well, let's try again. Oh, it still fails, okay. Uh, so, so what I mean is that you get, even if you don't really have uh, compile time evaluation, so if, as it, so you, you use a library that has it a lot, and you don't need it, you can still get into a situation where it gets really slow just because it exists. That's, so that's correct. So if you have a, a header that has a bunch of context expert and you don't actually care for it to be context expert, you as a user, you're, you're going to use those functions at runtime, you're still paying the compile time price. And that is one of the reasons, not the most important reason, but one of the reasons why implicit context expert is really not a good idea. Okay. Do you have, con do you have concerns specifically uh, related to is consent evaluated because it seems to require doing uh, like evaluation and then backtracking in many cases. So if I start using it in the uh, separate library, for example, are you worried about uh, existing programs starting to compile much slower? Um, not really, because we already do that even without this consent evaluator. We, we try to evaluate something and then it doesn't work. And then when we do code generation, we might try it again. Um, so I, uh, we have implemented this and it, there's no, none of our performance benchmarks um, suffered from it. Plus, uh, of course, we don't have that many based on is constant evaluated. Uh, we only have a few tests for that. But uh, I suspect it's not, not going to be bad at all. Thank you. What we're also finding is that uh, you run into the problem before you even start entering the function, because usually those cases don't have constant arguments. So usually it's, it's pretty good. Uh, thanks for the talk. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I have a uh, answer and a question. So to answer Peter's question, um, on CPPcast episode 185, uh, Rob and Jason had uh, Eric Vassilier on, who's the individual behind Constant, and he actually initially proposed this as a composition of existing keywords, and uh, the committee said that they thought it was too important not to have a keyword. Um, so they asked him to go back, write a new proposal with a new keyword. Okay. Um, I don't remember what the original composition of keywords was, but that's the history behind that. Um, and my question is, uh, is there any reason that C++ 17's uh, CTAD can't work with uh, like the second line here? Um, the second line, no, no, that could, that could have worked, yeah, sorry. I, I, I'm not a big fan of CTAD, and it, it doesn't jump at me when I write code, so. But I, I, think, I think, yes, you could do that, absolutely. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, in those 
last slides that you show the compilers and the performance uh, um, evaluating C++. There's uh, the C++ compilers aren't the only things that try to figure out C++. Yes, the correct. Other big things are tools where you want your development environment to be helpful and many times it just throws up its hands and says, I don't know what type this is. I can't help you. I don't know what functions to complete here. And the other big ones that also try to figure out C++ are humans. And they're having an increasingly hard time of it. Uh, that relates to the, the previous person's comment on very little diagnostic and very little feedback from this huge, increasingly bigger back, black box, which is the compiler that you don't know what it's doing, what it's giving you out, what, what's compiling. I'm not exactly sure what my point is. But no, but it's, a, it's an observation that is important, right? And, and it should at least inform our designs. Um, there's two parts in there. First is a tool issue. I think there is no future for tools, for C++ tools, that do not want to incorporate a C++ front end. I'm sorry, I mean, maybe there's still a lot of tools that are based on some fuzzy parsing, but I, I think it's a losing battle. And my company will sell you a really good tool for that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, for, 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 for friendly price. Now, you know, all joking aside, yes, I mean, there's still some tools that, that you know, uh, yeah. but more and more is, is becoming harder and harder, and I think it's a losing battle. Um, we do consider this, actually, in the committee. So people say, well, you know, this is going to be really hard to fuzzy parse. Uh, and so we do think about it, but it's not, it cannot hold us back from, you know, the, obviously the, there's all kinds of applications that people want to do. I think static reflection will be, I, I get mails very often that people want, want that. Um, well, I think to imagine about it is that you're reaching this world where you say you have this virtual machine inside the, the compiler. Pretty much any scripting language which has gotten that far had to come with the debugger. Yes. So in C++ will have to get there, otherwise it'll just it'll be its own uphill battle. Right, right. And in fact, uh, if you read P1240, we, we don't have a debugger, but at least we have reporting facilities. Like, yeah, there's, there's, there's functions with side effects in there that will tell you, oh, you know. Can you add you, prints? At least you, you have a print, basically. You have a compile time print, yes. Uh, so, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think you kind of already answered this question, but I was hoping I didn't hear the answer right or the answer is not right is what I want. So um, the thing I'd really love to be able to do is write a const expert function where at, if it's evaluated in a const expert context, I can static assert something about the arguments, that they're valid in some way. Yeah. And if it's in a runtime context, I can runtime assert on the arguments. And uh, I can't, and I have to do that under is, if const expert because the static assert will say, well, it's not a constant expression, but it, that stood is const evaluated is not the tool I need. Exactly clearly. right. That's exactly right. Uh, so, so that, that runs to that, that, that very, the, the paper from Andrew, you know, the evaluation is completely different from compilation. Um, now, if you read P1240, my, you know, my, my static expression paper, not mine, our, um, it actually has an alternative. What if instead of static assert, it would be a const expert assert? <laughs> right? Because in other words, it's not at parse time, but it's at evaluation time. That doesn't cover all the cases, but you can, you, you can basically trigger, say, well, okay, the, a, a condition based on values. Not on types, but on values you could. And with reflection, you can transform types into values and then things work again. Uh, well, contracts is runtime. You just have the compiler case. It's true, that's true, right. I haven't looked at... I haven't looked at contracts at all. All right. Th thank you, anyway. For, yeah. um, on the case where you had the main returning the, that G5 function yeah, yeah, yeah. on that uh, slide, there you had mentioned that it would always follow the mem set path. So ideally, yes. ideally, if you set the reason why I was asking earlier about the undefined behavior, <laughs> if you made the branches between is constantly evaluated, because that seemed like that would allow the compiler to say, well, I know I can take a is const evaluated path to evaluate and then just const fold the, the expression into a, you know, a constant yeah. value. It, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Well, we, we, the model was originally like that. And uh, Richard Smith 
shot such a big hole in that. It, um, oh, okay. So uh, I can't I can't remember. If I, I need to write an example that I cannot just produce on the fly. But he he created something that was incredibly inconsistent, like very 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 surprising. If you can do that. Um, okay. And um, also, and also, it would be non-portable because some compilers would try it and some would not, right? because you're not required to do a constant expression at that point. Um, so yeah, we originally it was that way that you would yeah you could just go ahead and try to do it. Uh, yeah. But okay. but it, it turns out to be a inconsistent. B um, the way Clang in particular uh, implements uh, constant evaluation. He was showing me scenarios that were just nightmarish, and so we couldn't do that. Oh, okay. But that's what I actually wanted originally. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Let's just take one, one more question. Okay. As a follow-up, as a follow-up to the assert question, um, aren't contract checking statements basically that const expert assert if they're on a const expert function? Uh, contracts, I thought right now, are not allowed in const expert. Uh, sorry, they're not. Sorry, they're allowed in const expert functions. No, they're not allowed in const expert functions. But through a bizarre rule in the language. But basically, then I believe you cannot. Uh, no, no, I take that back. Yeah, maybe they are. You're, you're right. Uh, <laughs> so sorry, I, you can't. You can't. You, you, you can't have a context evaluation where the contract is false, but but you can have one where it passes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, David is going to be around for a couple of days. Maybe yeah, until, Wednesday afternoon. until Wednesday noon, roughly. Okay, so if you have any other questions, you catch him then. Uh, let's give him a big hand. Thank you.